Oh boy. Watching Adventures in Music Theory with your host, Dr. Robbins. So hello. Today is Cinco de Mayo. So I hope you've got a margarita while you're listening to me. Today we're going to start something different. But before we do, I just want to ask you to do one thing. Perhaps you've received an email, but... If not, on behalf of our friends in institutional research, please fill out the course evaluation forms for not just for this course, but for all your courses this semester. They, they really want to collect that information, and I know that it's, it's going to be odd information we get this semester, given that things have happened a little bit differently than they usually go. But please, please fill out that information. You know, there's always useful stuff that we can learn from it, so... I would appreciate it if you would do that, and let's go ahead and talk about some ugly music today. That'll be fun. So, there's a good chance that you might be mentally, after four or five weeks, where composers were mentally after 25 or 30 years in the 1960s, i.e. you might be sort of at the end of your rope with atonal music and things like that. You know, we've looked at we've looked at non-serial atonality, we've looked at serial atonality, and you all might find yourselves feeling like you're ready to rebel against not necessarily the sound of the music or the aesthetic of the music even, but just the the actual practice of the music, the actual technique of it, and the way that that music is done. If you're like that, you're not alone. That's actually how a lot of composers in the 1950s and 60s felt as well, when there was that era when serial music sort of ruled the world for a few short decades there. And of course, anything tends to engender a reaction, and that's the case with serial music too. So today we're going to look at some of the music that reacts against it. Before we do, I've got a couple of works I want you to listen to. So I'll let them play, and then you can make your own opinions about it, and we'll come back and I will tell you some things about it. So, enjoy the pretty music. Thank you. 
Right. So those were two mid to late 20th century piano pieces. I think the first one's from 1946, and the second one's from the mid-1960s, I believe, but don't quote me on that. And you all may have noticed that they sort of sounded like some of the music we've been studying here of late. Uh, and I want to actually I want to talk about those pieces, because there's an interesting thing about them, which is that to a lot of people, they sound very similar. They sound this. They sound really to a lot of people topically the same. People notice that they're very arrhythmic pieces with a lot of dissonance in the foreground and not that regular sense of meter or rhythm that we usually experience in other works of the Romantic and Classic eras and stuff like that. Uh, I've got the scores for both of them. Here is what that Pierre Boulez work that we heard first looks like. And it looks probably rather the way you might think it would look. It's very, very meticulously notated. It's you know, exactingly notated. It's rhythmically complicated. It's got a lot of challenging things for the performer as far as intervallic leaps and weird interval combinations to perform and things like that. This is, in fact, a 12-tone work. I think this might be Boulez's first 12-tone work he wrote. He later went on to be one of the one of the main voices in integral serialism or total serialism in the 1950s and 60s. But this is his first 12-tone work, sounding like really what a lot of 12-tone piano works might sound like to people. And here's the other piece. And I'm willing to bet that this Morton Feldman piece doesn't look at all like you may have thought it might look even though it perhaps sounded to us very similar to the Boulez piece, it's not notated the same way. And at its heart, it's a very different type of piece. It's not nearly as exactingly notated. It's, you know, it's got its own notational system, and it's, you know, within its Within its own little system, it's very, it's very exacting and true to itself. Basically what happens is this. Each box equals one beat at 176 beats a minute. And the numbers in the boxes tell the performer how many notes to play on each beat and in what register. Medium register, high register, or low register. So for the first beat, there are three notes in the medium register. Then there are five notes in the high register over four notes in the low register. So that's how this piece is notated. Whenever you see like a box with bold facing around it, those are sustained notes. So this piece has a sense of being notated kind of quasi-precisely, but of course you're probably sitting there thinking, but there are no definite rhythms. There are no definite pitches. That's true. And yet, the interesting paradoxical thing is this piece, which is in some sense, less organized than the Boulez piece that's a 12-tone work that we just saw before this, this piece sounds not that different from it. And that's one of the, that's one of the like I say, paradoxes of the serial style, is that as hyper-organized as it is, to a lot of people it doesn't sound as tightly organized or any more tightly organized than a piece like this Feldman work where there's a fair amount left to the performer's discretion. You know, for instance, the performer gets to decide to a great extent, you know, what actual rhythm he or she plays on a given beat. And of course, they actually get to choose their own pitches as well. So, interesting. And this Feldman work is a good example of the musical style that sort of comes up as a reaction to serialism and that style is based on indeterminacy sometimes it's also referred to as aleatoric music and this indeterminate style instead of doing what serialism seeks to do which is to control things very very stringently put the notes in a row and dictate what order the pitches have to be played in and in the case of a total serial piece even you know start imposing that level of control over dynamics or rhythms or timbres 
these indeterminate pieces instead go in the opposite direction. They tend to, they tend to put a lot more freedom and decision making in the hands of the performer. They tend to be set up in such a way that each piece will be, each performance of a piece will be different, even if the same performer does it. These indeterminate works may incorporate elements of improvisation, or they may be indeterminate in terms of pitch, which is what we saw on the Feldman score that we looked at a second ago. They may have rhythmic indeterminacy by means of things such as what we call proportional notation or something, where a long note last longer on the page than a short note. And basically, the closer the notes are together, the faster they happen. But there aren't actual stems and beams on them the way we see in traditional music. They may be written in something called mobile form. And we'll look at one of those in a couple minutes here. And they may even be written using graphic notation that doesn't involve black dots and stems and beams. Uh, the the Feldman score that was actually written on a true honest-to-gosh graph was a good example of that, but there are even examples of composers making graphic notation where they, they're basically drawing a picture of what they want the notes to sound like. So let's look at some examples of all of these things. This is a John Cage solo piano work. Not the one you're thinking of, by the way, so the blank screen's not a joke. This is a Cage piece called Solo for Piano, and this is Cage's score. And if we look at it, we'll realize that he's got a very different approach to notation than somebody like Webern or Boulez, or for that matter, Cage's teacher, Arnold Schoenberg, has to, to notation. Uh, but there are elements that certainly look familiar to us. He's using staff notation, he's using clefs, he's using pitches. And let's, let's look in at this a little bit closer. You know, basically, the score is in four quadrants, this particular page. This is page 21 of the solo for piano. And let's just look at each corner of it. Let's look first at the upper left-hand corner. So in the upper left-hand corner, we can see some things that are fairly determinate. Notice he's using dynamics that, that seem familiar to us, you know, fortissimo, triple piano, and of course he's expressing pitches rather exactly. He's using sharps and flats even, which usually means you have a definite preference on what pitch you hear. Rhythmically, the piece is totally indeterminate. You know, there's nothing that says how long we're supposed to go from note to note to note. If we look at that bottom system, now that measure on the bottom of the page here, it certainly implies that the first three notes happen rather quickly, and then there's a little bit more space before the last two notes. But that may or may not be the ca case. I haven't actually read the performance directions for this piece. This is just what I was able to find on the internet, because I don't have all my books at my disposal. But that's the upper left-hand quadrant of this piece. Let's look at, let's look at the other side of the page now. This is the upper right, and it's a little bit more of a definite indeterminacy notation. If you, if you look at what's going on, he's got two different glissandi written out for the piano, one starting up high and moving down, the other starting down low and moving up high. You can see them crossing there, and he, he gives starting pitches and ending pitches, but of course, you know, it doesn't give a performer any real indication about the speed at which this is supposed to go or anything like that. So, you know, it's a very indeterminate way of writing a glissando. It doesn't actually involve writing out any pitches other than the starting pitch. And then there are just those lines that show us how the music is supposed to sound. And here's the lower left-hand corner of the page. Stuff's starting to get even more interesting because if you look at that, if you look at that crazy little scrawl down there, you can see all sorts of things with clefts that are letting us know that the registers are shifting about and things like that. And then he's got a little, he's got a little graph down there at the bottom with some measurements on it. I believe those are actually showing where on the piano, perhaps like how far inside the piano he wants people to be reaching, or something like that. I don't know. And here's the lower right hand quadrant. 
can see some more glissandi at the very lower right hand corner there uh, and of course there's that little wheel there where my guess is the performer is supposed to play those pitches in any sort of order they want or maybe starting at any point in the wheel and going around clockwise or counterclockwise or something but this is a good example of an indeterminate piece especially rhythmically where you realize that there's nothing telling us exactly what the durations of notes are supposed to be that's left to the performers discretion and here's something a little bit different still this is a work by Earl Brown the music for cello and piano it's a good example of this idea of proportional rhythmic notation and if you look you can see how long notes are horizontally extended and shorter notes are not extended so he shows he shows how he wants his notes sustained by actually making it a very visual thing that we can see but of course there's nothing that says exactly when things are to be attacked you get a you get a sense of which note is supposed to come before and after which other note but there's nothing that measures it out as as proportionally as we find it done in traditional music where things are done in you know two to one and three to one relationships and we use sixteenth notes and triplets and things like that to let people know exactly how we want things done but here we have this idea of this reactionary idea right reactionary against total serialism of composers deciding to put more freedom in the hands of the performers and here that freedom involves basically sort of letting the performers decide the rhythm or the time relationships of the piece and it gets more drastic composers even let performers decide the form of a piece and I'm going to show you that on the next slide here this is another work by Earl Brown it's an orchestra work called available forms one and this is one page from it and you probably notice the huge numbers written on there there's a big box with a number one in it, there's a box with a number two in it, etc. The way this works, it's an example of that thing that I referred to as mobile form earlier on. And when we talk about mobile form, we don't mean mobile in the sense of moving, like mobile meals or mobile home or something like that. When we talk about mobile form, what we're talking about is, you know, the thing that hangs over the baby's crib that maybe has like sheep and cows jumping over the moon and stuff. They're all off different arms and it like revolves around. That thing is called a mobile. And the thing that happens with a mobile is it revolves sort of haphazardly. And a lot of times, you know, depending on how it revolves and stuff, the baby may look up and see the sheep or the baby may look up and see a moon or a star or something like that. There's no there's no set way that it always happens and when a mobile form happens musically it happens in that same way like for instance the way a performance of this Earl Brown available forms goes is this the conductor holds up fingers and lets everybody know which number they're performing so if she starts the performance holding up three fingers then all the people who are playing down in box number three there will will play and they'll just keep playing that box until the conductor says to move on. And if you look at what's written in that box, you can see that there's a fair amount of indeterminacy in it. There are no specific rhythms notated or anything like that. There are some proportional notes that are written out very long to let us know they're supposed to be long notes. But the conductor might start out by holding up three fingers, and then after that's gone on for however long she thinks it should, maybe she holds up one finger and everybody goes back to the beginning of the page and all the people who are in box number one start playing and then you know perhaps the conductor decides that he or she wants to thin the texture down a bit so they hold up four fingers and just those four instruments that are written up there in box number four play so you know a performance of this you know performances are always going to go differently you can repeat sections if you want you can omit sections you know so each performance of it's going to be different uh, and it's sort of neat and it's like a lot of this post serial indeterminate music it's it's rather neat in an avant-garde way some of it sounds good some of it sounds bad by the way we could say the same thing about classical music and romantic music some of it sounds good some of it sounds bad but it's a valid way of writing music
It's clearly, you know, a way composers had of reacting against the uber control of serial music. And it's really fun to teach. It's fun to listen to. It's more fun to teach in music history classes because theory-wise, it's a little bit, it's a little bit of a letdown because there's not that much to analyze with this stuff. You know, it doesn't have any particular hardcore principles governing its construction. If we, you know, if we want to analyze a 12-tone piece, then there are definite principles governing its construction. We can look at the matrix, we can chase rows. If we want to analyze a Brahms string quartet, we can throw Roman numerals on that, we can talk about sonata form. But with these works, we don't really have that to fall back on. We can't even really discuss form, since the form can change from performance to performance. So, for these last two classes, though, I do want to focus on a couple of post-serial musical styles that we can analyze a little bit more deeply. So let's talk about the first one. That would be minimalism. And the thing you're looking at on the slide right now is the score of one of the first minimalist masterworks, if you will allow me that term, uh, a work by a guy named Terry Riley, written in 1964, and it's a piece called N.C. You know, the very name sounds like it has a simplicity to it that makes it different from the, the serial music of the 40s and 50s and stuff. You know, N.C., the most simple of keys. And there's a very definite simplicity to this type of music. And the way it works is this. Any number of people can play this piece for any length of time they want. There's one other part that goes on in the piece that's not shown on the page. But it's, it's a part that's supposed to be played throughout. Somebody's supposed to play pulsing eighth notes on the two highest C's on the piano. And that's supposed to play non-stop throughout the piece without changing tempo or anything. In fact, actually in the score, he does say the part is supposed to be played by a beautiful girl. You could say stuff like that in 1964, I suppose. But at any rate, the way this piece works then is you bring in whatever other instruments you want, and the instruments start at the beginning in those little numbered measures, right? Or numbered cells, I should call them. They're numbered one, two, three, four, five. People enter whenever they want, and they play each cell however many times they want before going on to the next one. And the piece is over when everybody's played all 55, or was it 53 cells, and they start dropping out one by one by one. So a performance of this piece could literally last days or weeks or years. It's just a matter of you know how long do people want to keep repeating things. One of the things I had planned for us this semester was that we were going to do a class performance of this piece at the end of the semester, but alas, it didn't happen. We did one in the class a few years ago. We sat out in the lobby one day during lunchtime and played the piece for about an hour or so, and people came and listened to as much of it as they could stand, and then they left. Some people came and played for a while, and then they left, but it was, it was sort of neat to do this. One person stayed for the entire performance and applauded when it was over. I'll let you guess who that was. It was E.T. McLean. That should surprise nobody. Anyway, this is, this is a good example of a minimalist piece. You know, everybody's playing the same melodic line in any octave they want, any amount of times they want. Uh, and we're going to look at some other minimalist pieces next. I want to look at a couple of minimalist pieces by a composer, Steve Reich. So let's see what we've got there. Okay, so Steve Reich introduces a technique into minimalist music that we refer to as phasing. And it's the idea of having two parts playing the same thing, but one part moves slightly slower or faster than the other, and they gradually drift out of phase with one another. And this is, a, this is a technique that Steve Reich comes to from doing electronic music. Uh, 
And it's not electronic music the way we might think about it now with computers and synthesizers and stuff like that. It's, it's hardcore, old-school electronic music, almost like what they'd call music concrete in the 1940s or 50s, where people would record like sounds on the street and then splice up the tape and make a soundscape out of it. But Steve Reich started doing work with recording human speech and then cutting just little snippets of human speech out and he noticed whenever you whenever you take like a little three to four second snippet of somebody speaking and you cut it up physical qualities of that repetitive speech so this work come out that we've got here he he took a sample of a guy who'd been arrested at a riot in the early 1960s, and they were, they were, you know, they had, there was, there were, you know, how in the early 60s were mid 60s. There were a lot of like civil rights protests and stuff, and there was a riot that was busted up, and the police told people, you know, we're going to, you know, we're taking everybody to jail or to the hospital. You know, if you're injured and bleeding, we'll take you to the hospital. Otherwise, you're going to jail. So Steve Reich had a recording of an interview with a guy who said that. He didn't want to go to jail, so he had a bruise, and he made the bruise bleed so that they'd see him bleeding and take him to jail, or to, excuse me, to the hospital instead of to jail. So the, the, the part of speech that Steve Reich isolates is this guy describing it, and he says, I had to open the bruise up and make some of the bruise blood come out to show them. And what he does then is he takes just that last part of the kid saying, come out to show them puts it on a loop so you keep hearing it come out to show them 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 and you can probably even notice with me saying it that there's a sort of rhythm to it and there's sort of a little a little swoop sound of the the sh sound in the word show what he does is he makes a makes a recording of that the guy saying come out to show them and then gets another tape loop of the same thing. That guy saying, come out to show them. Puts them on two different tape players and starts them playing in unison. And the thing that happens is, you know, because nothing is ever exactly the same as something else, eventually one of those two tape players drifts a little bit ahead or a little bit behind, and you start hearing the parts discoordinate, and they make this they make this sort of counterpoint with one another, where you start hearing all these neat little rhythmic interplays between them. And he lets that go on for a while, and then he gets four tape players and does it, and then he gets eight tape players and does it. I want you to listen to the first seven minutes of this piece. It's about a twenty-some minute piece. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the first seven minutes of it so I don't go to copyright person violating jail and stuff like that. So just listen to it and then come back and we'll talk about, we'll talk about some other applications Steve Reich finds for this idea of phasing. But here's what phasing sounds like in an electronic piece of music using recorded speech. Enjoy. I had to like open the blues up and let some of the blues blood come out to show them... I had to, like, open the bruise up and let some of the blues blood come out to show them. I had to, like, open the bruise up and let some of the blues blood come out to show them. 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 Come out to show them, 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 come out to show them. 
and come out to show 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 and come out to show
Well, I think it's neat. And, as the 60s go on, Reich wants to try to find ways to replicate these things, not using electronic sounds, but using actual live musicians in performance. He has a he has an ensemble that travels around and performs, so he wants to be able to write music that that ensemble can perform that takes some of these minimalist techniques and is able to pull them off in live performance. This is a Steve Reich piece called Piano Phase. Uh, I think from 1967. And it's a very simple piece for two pianos. And they both play the same thing. They both play this pattern. That's really me playing. Impressed. Anyway, so they both play that pattern, but what happens is they start out playing it in unison. They repeat it a certain number of times. You know, they, I think it's at their discretion, but they start out playing in unison. You can see it starts out with just one piano, and then the second piano joins in. And at some point, the second piano is supposed to pull slightly, imperceptibly, ahead to where the to where they're one sixteenth note ahead, so that what happens is when we get to the the measure at the end of the first line, you can see that now even though that piano is playing the same notes it was playing earlier, it's it's shifted them up in such a way that instead of the E starting it out and going E F sharp B C sharp, now the F sharp is coming first. It's going F sharp B C sharp D, and that E is moved to the end of the measure. And if you look at how the notes line up, you can see that you're going to get all these different intervallic relationships happening. You're going to get some very, some very cool little harmonic interval clashes. And when the parts are actually moving out of sync, you're not going to hear it going note against note, going da 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 da. But as one part starts moving from the other, you're going to start hearing da 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 da, and you're going to start hearing the, you're going to start hearing this sort of rhythmic you know, interplay and cross rhythm happening. And guess what? I want you to listen to the first seven minutes of this too. So I'll catch you on the other side.
All right. And that's all I really want to delve into for today. On Thursday, we'll talk about some other stuff. I think I'd like to look at an Arvo Parrot work or two, and maybe actually look at a work of George Ligeti or somebody like that as well. But for now, I want to talk about something else since this is our last week of classes. I want to talk about the final exam. Have you given much thought to the final exam? I've given some thought to it. And one thought I've had is this. Do we need to have it? Do you all want to have it? I'm actually willing to let the exam be optional. Two of you are graduating anyway, so you'd probably be excused from taking it if I decided to do that. But I'm also thinking about what we've done this semester, and I don't I don't feel like I need an exam to evaluate your work in the class. I feel like I have a sense of what you all have and have not grasped just from your performance on the test and then the homework and stuff like that. So I can, I can average your grades without the exam, and it's easy to do. I just don't put a grade in there, and you know, the program actually tells me what your grade is without the final exam. So I don't necessarily want to just decide for you that we're not taking the exam. So what I'm telling you today is this. I'm going to go with an exam is optional approach. And if you don't want to take the exam, I won't judge you harshly for that or negatively at all. And the part of me that has to grade the things will actually probably be really happy. If you do want to take the exam, I have an exam and I'm happy to give it to you and I will I will tell you what's on the exam. In fact, maybe next time when we're online on Thursday, I'll tell you all what the format of the exam is and you can decide for yourself if you want to take it or not. But the good news for today is this. You know, you came to you came to cyber class, you went online, you listened to some stuff. I played a bunch of crazy 20th century music. Some of it sounded cool. And then, after all that, at the very end, he said, you don't have to take the exam. So, wrap your brains around that. Your homework is to think about whether or not you want to take the exam for this class. Everybody doesn't have to decide the same thing. If you want it, you can take it. If you don't, don't. Send me an email and let me know your thoughts. I'm going to let you go. And I will catch up to you on Thursday. Wash your hands and stay safe and happy. Speaking of happy, happy Cinco de Mayo. Catch y'all Thursday. Bye-bye.